Good morning. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that your word is a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. Send your spirit to be our tutor this morning, that we may live lives that bring glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. What do you say to Christians who live in a hostile world? What do you say? Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against your soul and to live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of wrongdoing, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Is that what you would say? How you would say it? The apostle responds to these newborn babes in a hostile territory, and he gives this principle that he unpacks in this new section of Peter's letter. In verses 13 to 17, we'll look at civil authorities to show proper respect to everyone, to submit to every authority instituted among men. And in next week, verse 18 to 25, to the submission of employees to their employers, and then to wives, to their husbands in chapter 3, verse 1, and finally to elders, uh, to youth and elders in chapter 5. This is a difficult text. It's a challenging passage. Many today are wrestling with showing proper respect of submission to civil authorities. Take our global context. I think of believers in Turkey who can be aggravated and harassed by the police. Or those in Kazakhstan or Turkmenistan and Central Asia who don't look to the authorities to protect them from the social ostracism and the pressure by family members and friends on their newfound faith. Or those who are in Egypt or in Nigeria to show proper respect to authorities who intermittently perhaps support them or protect them from attacks and intimidation. I remember being in Nigeria a few years ago and teaching, and one of the other teachers was the Bishop of Bauchi. It's in northeastern Nigeria. And he told me how Boko Haram, the radical Islamic sect, had come into his city, blown up churches, and killed many Christians. And he went to the governor of his state because the governor had failed to protect him to retrieve the bodies of African Christians, because he knew, quite realistically, that the members of this radical sect would take those bodies and use them as trophies to sell them on the black market in the Middle East. This is a challenging text to think of believers in North Korea or in Saudi Arabia or Iran who are arrested and imprisoned, interrogated to show proper respect, to submit to whatever authority has been given among men. And closer to home in our own context under lockdown mode in COVID-19, where we are trapped in our homes or our apartments and where we are facing this rising and falling of this pandemic across the nation and the angst and the anger and the, the feelings of emotions stirred up by this pandemic, the people who are losing their jobs and failing to, to live ordinary, normal lives, to show respect to everyone. This is a challenging text also because of the trauma, the upheaval that we are experiencing across our nation through the conflicting narratives about law and order of race and truth and reconciliation and justice. It's, this is a traumatic period in our history. And it's a period when can draw us away from Peter's command to show proper respect to everyone and to submit to whatever authority has been instituted among men. 
It's a challenging text when many may feel want the need for retaliation or an eye for an eye. And yet, that's the point. That's the point of this passage because it forces us to a tight space to look at something difficult, and it's in those corners, in those hard places that God can meet us as we try to navigate ourselves what our role is in a hostile world. It was Martin Luther, the German reformer, who identified three keys of spiritual growth and maturity, of moral development, oratio of prayer, meditatio of a particular type of contemplation on the Holy Scriptures. But the third key was tentatio, of spiritual trial, of being in the corner with God, with the text, wrestling in the, ma- in the midst of social and cultural upheaval, that through that pressure cooker experience would come out of something deep, something enduring, something steadfast. And so, as we look at this text this morning, I invite you to wrestle with your own conscience, to wrestle with your own soul and spirit, to navigate what it means to live in a hostile world and what it means to abstain from those sinful desires, what it means where we are part of the problem and we also need to be part of the solution that we face. As we consider our text this morning, I want to consider it under three areas, submission, freedom, and fear. First of all, submission, verses 13 and 14 and the end of 17. Second of all, freedom, verse 16. And then finally, fear. So first of all, let's take a look at submission, verse 13 and 14. Peter said, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority under men, whether to kings as a supreme authority or to the governors who have sent, who've been sent to punish wrongdoing or to, or to commend what is good, and then later on, honor the emperor. The New International Version translates this as every authority instituted among men. The English Standard Version translates it as every institution ordained among people. It's the prevailing interpretive lens to look at this as the office or the institution of civil authority. There is a case, though, to be made for the incumbent or the individual, the reference here to kings and governors, to the emperor, indicates that though they may slander and malign these newborn babes in this hostile territory, that they too are created in God's image and therefore worthy of respect and deference. But I'm going to take this for the office, following the ESV and the NIV. The apostle says, submit. It's a strong word. It's in the imperative. It's repeated in this new section of the letter. And it's in the passive voice to yield, to come under the authority of whatever authority has been given by men. And he says a very interesting phrase about submission. He says, submit yourselves, that these exiles in foreign territory are to exercise this internal discipline, if you will, of submitting themselves. But then he has the little phrase, for the Lord's sake. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. And I think there are several ways, if we look at Scripture in a larger context, why, for the Lord's sake, the apostle is calling these new believers to submit. First of all, for the Lord's sake, for the Lord's purpose in giving civil authorities. In the book of Romans, chapter 13, the other apostle says that in verse 4 that now the authorities are God's servants to do you good. If you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword in vain. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, to punish wrongdoing. In other words, the civil authorities from the Lord's perspective are deacons. Literally, they are deacons with a sword to do you good. 
It is the Westminster Confession that outlines this further, saying that the purpose of civil authority is to protect individuals. It is to protect the good name of all people. It is to protect them from indignity. It is to protect them from injury. It is to protect them from violence. So that is the first reason why he says, for the Lord's will, for the Lord's purpose. But there is another reason, the Lord's example. In John 19, 11, the Lord himself is under trial under Pontius Pilate, and he says to Pontius Pilate, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. And there the Lord recognizes a certain legitimacy to Pilate's authority, to the Roman administration. And he recognizes by the same token that in the sovereign plan of God, that this God would use and include even a weak and cowardly pilot, and he would use even a corrupt and broken judicial system. And then the Lord himself submits as a lamb led to the slaughter. Not only is it God's good purpose, not only is it God's example, but it is also his teaching. We find in Mark 12, 17, where the Lord is in con consultation and discussion with the leaders. And he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And he's saying, yes, there is a certain legitimacy to Caesar and to the Roman administration, and that, yes, they are to pay their taxes. They are to give Caesar his due, and as foreigners and exiles in the land, one would say that they are to be good citizens. They are not to give grounds to the pagans to malign or to heap insults on the name of Christ. It's a verse that is sometimes used as a proof text for the separation of church and state. That's quite different, in fact, from the historical context of this interaction. Jesus was drawn into an argument that had been circulating in Jewish circles for many years. It goes back 200 years prior when Judas Maccabeus led a revolt against the Syrian imperial army and his slogan was, pay back to the Gentiles what they deserve and keep the commandments. That was his slogan, pay back the Gentiles as they deserve and keep the commandments. And so Jesus was saying, yes, there is a certain legitimacy to Caesar, and perhaps he needs to be confronted. But there is another authority. There is an overriding power. There is a greater regulation that will call even Caesar to account. As Cyprian, the African theologian, said that God gives good gifts to those in civil authority to use for good. But when they use their, good, their gifts for evil, God will call, bring them to judgment. So Peter says, submit yourselves to whatever authority is instituted among men. It's his response to these newborn babes in foreign territory. And we know in the ancient world, in the medieval world, in the contemporary world, that civil authorities can be corrupt, can be violent and cruel. Look at our own context here. Next weekend, we're about to celebrate the 4th of July, a time when loyalists 100 years ago would reference Romans 13 to defend George III. And I suppose if they were correct that, well, we'd all be speaking the Queen's English and watching cricket, drinking tea and eating crumpets. So there is obviously a case to be made that this is not blind submission. And whatever our emotions and feelings are about this, it's a complicated topic of what it means not to submit to civil authorities. And I don't have time this morning to detail and describe some of the extent of what this can look like. But I do want to make plain the teaching of Scripture of three conditions where non-submission is legitimate biblically. The first one is where the civil authorities command what God forbids. 
We had this in our Old Testament reading this morning from Daniel 3. In Exodus 19 and 20, the, the Lord commands His people not to bow down to images or to idols, but yet Daniel in Babylon in exile is ordered by the civil authorities to do just that. And he says in verse 18, be it known to you, O king, we will not serve your gods or bow down in worship to the golden image you have set up. But there is another case where believers are morally obliged not to submit. And that is where the civil authorities forbid what God commands. At the end of the Gospels in Mark 16 and Matthew 28, the Lord himself says, go into all creation and preach the gospel. Make disciples of all nations. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And so Peter and the apostles go into Jerusalem to proclaim the good news. And the authorities come down on them like a pile of bricks. They're hauled in before the authorities in Acts 4 and 5. And Peter says in Acts 5, 29, we must obey God rather than men. There is another case where believers have moral permission to not submit to the civil authorities. It's the case where laws themselves are unjust and where human welfare is at stake. A classic case in this is Luke 13. It's where our Lord is in the presence of a woman who's been crippled, who's paralyzed, and he heals her on the Sabbath. And he says in Luke 13, 16, is not this a woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound for 18 years to be loosed from her bond on the Sabbath day? And so he puts her welfare above the regulations. The Christian statesman and leader John Stott writes in quite some length about the relationship between civil authority and non-submission. And he makes it quite clear that Christianity is not to be reduced or to be identified with a political program. He argues convincingly that the, where that happens, there's a false distinction between party politics on the one hand and legitimate political participation. It is in fact the case that all believers, whether they are foreigners and exiles or whether they're in their homeland, are citizens of two lands. They have a dual identity. They have an identity in heaven. They have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. They have responsibilities in their heavenly kingdom. But it is also the case that they have responsibilities on earth as citizens to contribute. They are to be informed about the issues of their day. They are to vote. They are to engage in public debate and discourse. They are to lobby or demonstrate. They can form groups or join groups of shared moral and spiritual social concerns. There is a responsibility that believers have, exiles or not, in their heavenly kingdom as much as in their earthly kingdom. This week I had the good fortune to be in communication with two lawyers they're leading lawyers in mainland China, committed believers involved in their church under a political system that is quite different from a liberal democracy. And perhaps in some ways they understand some of the tensions and the conflicts and the difficulties of what it means to live under such a jurisdiction. What I found interesting was that they were revealing to me that often the Western media doesn't pick up some of the subtleties or the differences that are going on within Chinese society today. And we're saying that actually, among lawyers and perhaps others, there is quite a discussion about the nature of political structure, about what systems and structures would serve the interests of the majority of society best. But one thing that is a common thread throughout those discussions within mainland China is a, a belief that politics is the answer, that politics is the last solution. And I think that we could be safe to say that it is not just our Chinese brothers and sisters who look to politics as the ultimate solution. That it is a temptation that we can face in our own country too. Well, Peter tells these new believers to submit. He tells them to show proper respect to everyone. But he also tells them about freedom in verses 16. He says, live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. 
When I was a student, I rented a room from my pastor. He would rent out rooms in his house to college students. And we would have breakfast every morning at 8 o'clock sharp, read a short Bible verse, have a quick prayer, and do the dishes by 8.30, and we were gone. At the weekend, on Sundays, we'd have lunch with whoever happened to be visiting, a visiting preacher or teacher from out of town or from another country. And it was an amazing experience at such a young age to engage so directly and closely with various leaders. The pastor's name was Mark, Mark Ruston. And he was, in many ways, this quintessential British bachelor in his mid or early 70s at the time. And I remember him telling me or asking me a question with a twinkle in his eye, and I always feared his questions because I knew that there was an answer that he was perhaps expecting and was worried that I wasn't going to come up with the answer that was approved. Well, his question was this. He said, Julian, how do you define a true British gentleman? How do you define a true British gentleman? He says, well... A true British gentleman is a man who uses his butter knife in private. He doesn't just use it in public, but he uses it in private. Well, perhaps it's a little quaint and archaic and irrelevant to our context, but I think it points to something else. It points to something about transparency of a connection or a disconnection between who we are in private and who we are in public. Peter is speaking to aliens and strangers in foreign territory, people who have been liberated and freed from the darkness, from their ignorant desires, from their sinful past. They have been liberated that they may practice righteousness, that their desires may no longer conform to this world, but to the Holy Spirit, to the sanctifying work, that they may praise their Maker, they may live for Him and to be servants of Him. And I know that for many in this COVID-19 experience, that in lockdown mode, there is this feeling of weariness. I know I feel weary, wearing my mask, practicing social distancing, not being able to see my friends, not to be able to be hugged or to hug. And I know for some that there's a time when there may be a lapse back to old patterns of thinking or old patterns of behavior or old sins or a sense of loneliness, or a sense of anger at the police, or a sense of uh, despondency about the future or the hopelessness, a sort of quagmire that you, one can feel oneself in. And Peter is saying, live as free men. Let the Holy Spirit do His work. I think an encouragement in our context is the very writer of our letter, Peter himself, The apostle was a strong man. He was a leader. He was someone people followed in his community. And yet, he denied his master three times. And at the very moment when his master needed him, he ran away. He abandoned him. And it broke Peter. He wept. He was a man of contrition. And after the resurrection, his master came to him and he asked him, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Tend my sheep, feed my lambs. Tenderly, he restored the apostle. And then he said Peter would stretch out his arms and another would dress him and carry him where he did not want to go. He said this to show the way by which he would die and glorify God. Peter was not a perfect apostle, but he was forgiven. And he was given hope after his contrition, after his repentance, after his breaking down. The Lord, his master, came to him and gave him a future, gave him a purpose to glorify God even by his way of death. There is encouragement for us too, wherever you are, to live as servants of God. Peter commands these new believers to show proper respect to everyone, to submit for the Lord's sake to every human authority, 
and to live as free people, not to use their freedom as a cover-up for greed or malice or racism or any other sin. But finally, he urges them to fear God. He talks about loving the brotherhood, but he also talks about fearing God. In chapter 1, he has explained that these new believers call on a father who judges each person's work impartially. Therefore, they are to live as foreigners, live out their time as foreigners here in reverent fear. And he signals later on in chapter 4, verse 17, that judgment will begin at the household of God. Much like in Ezekiel 9 through 10 and 11, how judgment begins at the household of God. And therefore, they should fear God. He is the judge, as we've sung about in our service today. And the apostle himself had learned well from his master. His master had taught in Luke 12, 4 and 5, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing else they can do. I will tell you who to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, fear him. Fear God. These believers are to fear God not only because of the judgment, but also because of wisdom. It's quite possible here in the letter that Peter is reflecting and meditating on Proverbs 24, 21, of fearing God, stronger than than fearing, perhaps fearing the emperor, but fearing God. It's a word that is difficult to translate and capture in English. The Hebrew and the English don't quite exactly correspond, and people have argued about respect or deference or awe or some other term, but fear is the one that these translators have used. And it's the fear that doesn't make you run away from God because that would be counterproductive. It's the fear that makes you tremble. It's the fear that makes you tremble and acknowledge that you are not the center of the universe, but that you are in the presence of the one who is the center of the universe. Proverbs tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the opposite of being wise in your own eyes. The fear of the Lord is the beginning, the middle, and the end of life, this path, this journey, this pilgrimage on earth through its ups and downs, its valleys and high points. The fear of the Lord is what the authors of the wisdom literature said that a person needed. They needed it because life was unpredictable. Time and chance happen to all. Death is inevitable. Injustice is a matter of part of part and parcel of life. Therefore, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That fear of the Lord is what these new believers need to navigate their path, to find their way in hostile territory. That fear of the Lord is the beginning, the middle, and the end of wisdom. And so, as we look and wrestle with this passage today, I want to close with some thoughts about what it means to be in exile. Being in exile means being out of your comfort zone, out of the routine, out of the ordinary. They are foreigners. They are maligned. They are suspect. And yet Peter, in his letter, has said that they are a royal nation, a holy people, a people belonging to God, God's people. And people who under God are chosen by God. He explains that this God is their father. He has chosen them according to his foreknowledge. He knows every hair on their head. He knows the end from the beginning. He created heaven and earth. He governs history. He is the transcendent God, which for modern people is very difficult to grasp because modern people and for the last 500 years have lived under the, the illusion that the imminent is the only reality and that the transcendent is not real. But for most of history, that has not been the case. And Peter reminds his readers that this God, this Father, is a God of grace. And he promises in chapter 5, verse 10, the God of all grace who's called you to his eternal glory in Jesus Christ after you have suffered a while, will himself restore, establish, and strengthen you. You may feel, we may feel we are abandoned, we're forgotten. But your heavenly Father has not forgotten you. He is a Father of grace. He loves you. 
But not only is, do we have a God, a Father who loves us, we have a Spirit. He says you're sanctified through the Spirit, the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. And this is the pressure cooker experience of being in that struggle space, that tight spot where the Holy Spirit, where the Word, where God, where the context that we're in, all can work together to manufacture, to produce within us the sanctifying, not so much of our behavior, but of our desires, of our proclivities, of our dispositions, of our aspirations, that the Holy Spirit can deep down deep into our bigotry, into our presumption and our sense of entitlement, into our lusts, into our pride and prejudices. The Holy Spirit can work within us so that we may abstain from those sinful desires that wage war against our soul, but also that the Holy Spirit, the sanctifying work of the Spirit, can produce in us this outward public expression as citizens who are exemplary, as citizens who contribute as citizens who are full of light and salt to their culture and to their community. And Peter also reminds his, his followers, his believers here, that they are to obey Jesus Christ. They are chosen by the foreknowledge of God through the sanctifying work of the Spirit through, for obedience to Jesus Christ. They are to obey their Master. They are to follow their Master, His example, His teaching, His purposes. Jesus is the only person who's walked on this earth who has shown proper respect to everybody. He is the only person who has submitted himself to every human authority. He's the only person who has lived a free life, bound to the will of God that his Father's will not his be done. He was the most free person in all the world. When he was reviled, he did not retaliate. When he was insulted, he did not insult back. When people spoke evil of him, he did not speak evil of them. He was tempted in every way and yet without sin. There was no deceit on his mouth. And he is described as the grace of God. And this is the very purpose of Peter's, Peter's letter. We find it in the last chapter. Chapter 5, verse 12, he says, Stand firm in the true grace of God. Yes, I feel it, I imagine you feel it, a sense of I'm going to implode if this goes on any longer, or I'm going to explode, or I'm going to do some kind of plode. It's just intolerable what we are going through right now. And yet, Peter, his heart as the chief pastor is that they stand firm in the true grace of God, and the true grace of God can be found in Jesus Christ. As we repent of our sin, as we cry out for mercy, that he will enable us to show proper respect to every person, that he may show us and enable us to live as free people, not to cover up our, our sins through our behavior, and that we may fear God, our Maker, our Father, our Judge, and that he may give us his wisdom this week as we follow him. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your, your servant, Peter. We praise you for his wisdom. We praise you that though he suffered, he was able to teach others. We ask you, Lord, to have mercy on us that we may follow his example, receive your grace, the true grace of God in Christ, that we may not waver, we may not wander, we may not wobble, but we may be firm because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.